Yeah, welcome back. Uh, we have seen some parts of, of our work already, and uh, we are now progressing to look into, going more to look into data <coughs> and uh, the content that we work with. And I would like to talk a bit more about the Ubina publishing framework and the Ubina licensing uh, frameworks. And some of it, I think you, you probably touched, or we, we touched yesterday uh, in the context of the presentations and workshops of the, the Hispana colleagues. Um, but um, I would like to elaborate on a few things a bit <coughs> more. And when I talk about the publishing framework, I always like to start with an anecdote. Um, it dates back from January 2014 when we worked with an institution um, to publish their data on Europeana. And yeah, I mean, we were, we were almost there, we were almost done. And then they came to us and we, when we asked them like, what do we actually want to do once we have published our data? And then, yeah, okay, would, would, would be great if we can do some promotional activities like a, a, a blog on Europeana Pro would be good or maybe even an, an, a virtual exhibition or something like this. Social media outreach would, would be nice as well. <coughs> uh, but then we actually have managed to get to see what they want to publish. And it basically was a collection that was, it gave no access to the content. It was all in copyright. Um, and yeah, we, we had to go back to them and say, it's actually not, so, uh, not, not possible what you, are, what, you are, what you would like to do. And you, you can imagine that was quite disappointing um, for, for us uh, because also we worked on that and for them as well. So we said, wouldn't it be better if we clarify those questions like upfront <coughs> and, and to discuss things to avoid those disappointments and maybe see um, if there are things that we can, we can work on and work out together um, to, to improve the situation. Um, all of this, uh, of course, then is based on what, what Europeana was actually built on and uh, everything that we, we can do uh, really is also built on what, what we were set up with. And as uh, we heard in the morning, um, we were set up as a digital library, really where we, we, we started with the ambition to really <coughs> uh, provide access to Europe's digital cultural heritage, um, to images, to videos, to sounds, to 3D, to text. Uh, but to do this via the metadata that we uh, publish, not by storing the content uh, itself. So it's really an, <coughs> uh, but, st but still, full access to, to content is our ambition to enable all those use cases that also Isabel was, was mentioning um, be be before. Um, and that's also what we would like to encourage for institutions publishing with us. <coughs> and so that case I mentioned before was actually something that based on how we work, wasn't really something we, we can uh, deal with. And based on, on how we work, um, this also had led to the development of the uh, standards and frameworks that we work with, like the even a data model uh, we've spoken about yesterday, um, I think launched finally in 2013, is really our way to, to enable this cross-domain access to, to to these data <coughs> and the publishing framework, uh, which uh, was launched in 2015, al is also very much following the same uh, line and um, based on the assumption that the more you give, the more you will also get. And maybe it's a, also another anecdote. Um, we are going like a bit uh, full loop now. Um, this is a, these are pictures from the uh, annual general meeting of the Europeana in 2014 in Madrid, where the content reuse task force back then laid the foundation for the Europeana publishing framework. Um, I still remember more or less, I, I, I didn't, don't think I would be able to find this room back, but um, yeah, I have a sense of where, where it is. So that some of the people are still also working uh, with us um, uh, these days, but it really was, <coughs> Uh, almost 10 years ago when we started to really work on the publishing framework. Just after that anecdote, 
I mentioned before, in January 2014 happened. Uh, and the licensing framework at the end um, is, is the third element here, which I think uh, was launched even 2011, so before all, all of the others. That is really our way of, of helping to guide us through the um, work on copyright and licensing. And in the meantime, we are actually at the point where we don't publish anything anymore in Neopiana that is not compliant with any of the rules, not compliant with EDM, not compliant with the publishing framework or with the licensing framework. These are all <coughs> uh, fundamental pillars of our work um, that are that uh, nothing gets published that is not compliant with that. And <coughs> uh, yeah, we, we just check, yeah, we're getting to this. So, so we have heard about um, uh, some of the, the benefits you, you will probably, you can probably get, and Isabel discussed this a bit more. Um, I would like to focus a bit more on what you actually need to actually um, make this possible also for yourself and to start practicing uh, with Menti um, again. <coughs> we have another Menti uh, slide deck and um, so be aware that Menti slide deck uh, we will use throughout the rest of this uh, session until also Adina's presentation. Um, so we, we pause here and there and I Hope the QR code works. Otherwise, I will give you also a Menti um, um, a code. Uh, I'll give you a second. I see a couple of phones still up in the air um, to take a picture. And There are people coming in. Let's see if that wor works also with that thing. Should should be the same thing. So in, in case you um, the, the code is also here if you if you rather use your laptop. Um, and I said like keep that open um, throughout the, the morning. We will come back to that. <coughs> uh, we start with an easy question, I think. Uh, um, going again in the, remembering the benefits that Isabel has spoken about and uh, we have seen. Um, just to get an idea of, of you already, how, 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 how your understanding is. Um, what do you feel, what do you think, like how important are the uh, following aspects of data quality to actually benefit from all of this? How important is our high resolution images and um, text you can actually read, how important are open licenses, um, watermarks, meaningful titles, <coughs> um, the, the contextual information that we've discussed yesterday um, quite a bit, is that something you, you, you think would, uh, would really help you uh, or is that not the case? I can't read from here actually how many people are voting, so I'm Counting. Uh, okay. Wow, I'm more than 60. Still, still counting. <coughs> um, yeah, uh, it's not really surprising. The only surprising thing maybe for me as a result is this, um, on, on watermarks. And I will come back to that actually later. Uh, because watermarks are actually something we don't really like a lot. And I will also maybe uh, sh show you a bit why. I have an example uh, with me. Um, the second question uh, would be, where do you see yourself also on that journey? Do you understand all those conceptual things and, and theories behind this so you actually um, can, can work with that? O and also the second would be, how, where are you like with your practical knowledge? Do you, can you, you say like, yeah, 
um, I can leave the room immediately because you know uh, how it works, or maybe you can come, come to stage and present on, on my behalf. Um, wh where are you also after having listened to the workshops yesterday and so on? Ha uh, are you already, uh, do you feel like you're in a good shape um, to actually make your data, data work um, so they can flourish, grow in the data space? Yeah, it seems like there's, uh, of course, more that you know about how you can do this before you actually can, can do it, which makes, makes sense. <coughs> um, but it looks, looks promising, so it uh, seems like I'm not going from stage now, but um, talking to a um, knowledgeable audience, this is very, very nice. <coughs> um, so I'm also expecting maybe some more in-depth questions afterwards. Uh, we can we can talk about. Um, maybe leave Menti for now. I think because the next one coming up is the the next session. Now let's. Um, before we all uh, look at more detail in, at data quality, another view on um, the visibility ex aspect. Uh, we have heard about the usage dashboards before. I've actually also sp uh, spoken to um, uh, one of you uh, uh, over the coffee break uh, about those usage, usage dashboards. Um, like, we s like Isabel said, uh, we've, we've started sharing them with some of you already. I think with about 20 institutions um, we've done so. Uh, if you still haven't received it, but still would be interested, let me know. I also would like to hear any feedback you have about this. For those who you have received this, is that what you were expecting? Uh, are the numbers all right? Are there any questions you are having? Uh, because for, for us, it's, um, it's a new thing we are doing, and with Spain as the, the first country uh, that we are really reaching out with those dashboards. So your feedback would be really helpful for us to uh, see how we can maybe develop this further, uh, improve things, um, and uh, yeah, reach out to, to more countries as well. So any feedback you have, most welcome. Um, what I wanted to say here is um, I, I looked at a few that actually <coughs> um, also that were re re requested, and I see something like uh, a few interesting things. Um, this is from the Digital Library of Castilla in, in Lyon. No, one, no idea if anyone is in the room, but um, for the last half year, uh, we see about uh, 2,000 page views, um, uh, which I don't think is, is, is too bad. Um, worth to keep in mind, this is a collection of about 60,000 um, items in Europeana. <coughs> uh, another interesting one is a much smaller collection, the Capuchin Central Library of Spain. Uh, it's only 2,000, 2,500 items, um, and still almost 300 page views over the last um, six months. And the third example I have is actually from the library of the University of Las Palmas, uh, who have quite a huge collection, more than 100,000 items, but only 150 page views. Um, and I don't know if their content is so, so uninteresting for an audience, but what I realized is when, when I'm looking at this and comparing it, that the data quality of uh, what uh, comes from Castilla y Leon and uh, the Capuchin Library is much higher than what we get from um, Las Palmas. So my, my guess is that also those collections are easier to discover and maybe more people will in, uh, find them and interact with them, um, which could be an argument to think about like together how can we, that investing in data quality actually makes a difference. Um, I, I still want to do a bit more of a deeper analysis of, of more of those usage data to see if that pattern is, is more uh, consistent. <coughs> but it's something, at least, it, it feels like a natural con conclusion that investing in data quality um, should hopefully then help us to, to get uh, higher visibility, get more, more audiences uh, engaging with your collections. But what is data quality uh, for us? Um, because that's something also important to have in mind. Uh, what data quality is for us may be something different than what data quality is uh, for, for you. It's a relative thing. And we don't say anything is, is bad or th 
the, the, the best. It really depends on the purpose and the context. And what we define data quality is really based on the way Uperna was set up from the beginning. That's always what we have to have in mind. And there's also something maybe to keep in mind when we go into the data space, things may become more flexible. Like bibliographic data, I've said before, will play a role in the data space. And for your piano, as it currently stands, this would be tier zero. Like, this would be basically the worst quality ever, <coughs> which is actually not, not the case. The bibliographic data are useful, uh, just not for your piano as it currently stands. So that's always something to have in mind. So we work currently with the our setup uh, of how we work uh, these days. And in this uh, context, <coughs> that's what the publishing framework looks like. I'm not sure this is readable from the back of the, 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 the room. It's basically that, that same uh, constant, the more you give, the more you get um, from the pinkish colors in the middle to the green colors in, in, in the end. The more you invest in, um, maybe make it bigger that way, in high quality media, direct media links, uh, reusable items, um, meaningful titles, and so on, the more you benefit from higher visibility, um, reuse scenarios that we've spoken about. So that's <coughs> the, the whole ambition of, of or the, the whole principles that the publishing framework is working with. <coughs> Let's take a closer look at some of those dimensions. Uh, look at the media quality. Um, I, I hope you would agree with me that the left picture would be less usable than the right one. And even the right one is not really of the, the best possible quality we can have. <coughs> but what we see on the left is still something we can find in your piano um, these days, um, where it's very difficult to actually see what the, the, the item actually is. Um, <coughs> so this is something that is, uh, from a technical perspective, this is smaller than 0.1 megapixel. So on the Ubernet website, if you go there, this looks like, like a stamp. It's nothing more than a stamp. Um, uh, and this is, um, yeah, <coughs> old data, we know it, um, but something we actually have to, to work on. Um, this is much better. Um, we, we've mentioned, like, we had a discussion yesterday about source data, best possible quality, PDFs, um, JPEG, and, and so on. And um, for your piano, um, the highest possible quality that we uh, label then as what we say content tier four is about one megapixel in size for an, for an image. Like this map, um, this is from, from Spain and also about the region in Spain. Um, and it's actually good enough quality that you can actually read the locations and places on the map. Um, so that works quite well. <coughs> um, the interesting case, what is not covered, also by the publishing framework as it currently stands, uh, this item has a, has a watermark. Um, so this is something that, um, yeah, it's not, in the first phase of the publishing framework, we thought about, can we actually also make watermarks a quality criteria? But as they are very difficult to, to measure and, and, and cl classify, uh, we left this out. Um, for you to know, we are currently in the process using AI to <coughs> identify watermarks, classify them, and see if that will help also to, to improve that situation, because this often is something we hear back from users as a problem. If they see an Im image, but then that they potentially can reuse, but then have a watermark, <coughs> it, um, it pushes them away from, from using it. Um, and this one is particularly interesting because also it, it has this copyright symbol in the beginning. In the, in the, and if you look at the, the actual item, it's labeled as in being in the public domain. So this would be available for use, but that copyright item uh, icon may indicate it's actually in copyright. So that's actually a question that I'm having um, myself. So if anyone that knows more about this item or from the organization is here, would be very much happy to talk about this to maybe clarify the situation, uh, what's, what's happening here also from the, uh, from the um, copyright perspective. <coughs> um, for text, the situation is a bit different. Um, for text, the presence of a PDF link, as we've discussed yesterday, is currently one of the, the main 
um, main thing that drives uh, quality up into uh, content tier, tier four. So this um, newspaper uh, has this. This also has um, um, actually quite a good quality thumbnail that you can almost read what's, what's on there and a direct link to a PDF. And it's uh, labeled as CC0, so freely reusable. Um, in contrast to this one, um, and this has no direct link to a PDF uh, from another provider. It's also um, with a different uh, license. And here, <coughs> um, that's why it's ending up in content tier one, like um, in, in lower quality. Uh, the interesting thing, and that's something, um, that's why I'm mentioning it, we had those discussions in the past, is important to clarify. <coughs> this is how a direct link uh, to a PDF currently looks like. You, you, you click on this in your Piana, and it opens the PDF directly. Um, and this is what works. For, for the other item, uh, you have to click basically a different link, and you get to the viewer of the um, institution the, and see this also a PDF, but in their own viewer. You will see it in a different environment. Um, and this is a difficult scenario for us. Even if for a user, you could argue, I mean, you can read this. You can read it in the same way as the other item. Um, it's also only one click away from your piano to, to read this. But for us, it's not possible to actually know that behind that website, there's a PDF. It could be just any website. Um, and we, that's also, Adina will talk about this a bit more, uh, in order to calculate the data quality and estimate of wh what it is, we actually w need to get access to the, the actual item to know what is the technical quality of this. Is it a high resolution image, yes or no? Uh, if it's PDF, is it actually a good quality PDF? Um, for videos, we, we also uh, calculate some criteria to know if this is actually something a user can work with and so on. And for a link to a book viewer, even if that contains a very readable PDF, we are not able to get this information. So that's why we classify this as being low quality, knowing um, a user can still uh, work with that perfectly. That's also saying in, in another uh, confirmation of this data quality as a relative concept, but we have to work with, with something. And this is um, how we set these things up. And for us, it will be very difficult to change that approach um, so we're not, not rejecting anything you submit to us that comes with the viewer. Um, we know the limitation it has, um, but it will still end up being in content tier one and not being measured as being of higher quality. This is um, <coughs> how, how it works. Um, and this is summarized also here on this, uh, this slide, uh, why this is. What is interesting to see and that's another um, point I'm coming to very soon, talking about copyright. Um, both newspapers are more or less from the same um, period. Um, so the newspapers themselves should be in the public domain. Uh, in one case, it's, uh, um, they waived all rights. In the second case, it's still coming with a very restricted uh, license. Uh, we have learned yesterday or heard yesterday that this is possible in, in Spain um, to, to claim copyrights of, of digitized items for 25 years, I think, what, what Julio mentioned. But there are also alternatives, like you, you can at least waive those rights uh, to make it possible to, to use it uh, more widely. Uh, so that's something we would at least encourage. Um, if you uh, claim those copyrights, you could still maybe move to a more open license, uh, maybe leaving out the non-commercial and non-derivative um, aspects <coughs> to encourage uh, reuse in a, in a wider way. Um, you, so you may have realized that um, we are not displaying PDFs on the Ubina website anymore like we've done in the past. Uh, we've, we've done this to actually use um, a AAAF viewer. We've heard uh, about AAAF yesterday, the International Image Inter of Interoperability Framework. And for us, this is um, still like the, the, the future. So we also have established this as our main presentation in interface using a AAAF viewer on our website um, to interact with images and text for now. So 
I don't know how the infrastructures are in, in, in Spain. There, are f there was one example I remember from yesterday uh, where there's uh, something happening. Right now, we don't have any AAA from Spain. Um, if there are questions about this, also things we can help with on the data modeling side, we are very happy to help also answering questions and um, go through this <coughs> um, because this is really what, what we think also works well for, for text. Uh, here you have a chance to actually, if you have a high-risk JPEGs uh, or images for your texts uh, or maps or so digitized, uh, you can make this available online uh, without the user having to download like huge PDFs and you can interact uh, with this in a, a very seamless way or online and navigate between pages, read the text or um, look at the images in very detail. Um, so this is very also the still the best way of displaying things on, on the web. And I've talked mentioned copyright before, uh, so a few words about this and also making the link to the European licensing framework. <coughs> um, this is a, a set of policies um, and, and contracts that deal with the copyright and licensing aspects of, of Europeana. It's, it helps to really also make sure that users know what they can do uh, with every item that's published on our site um, and also how they can interact with metadata and content. And it is also for us important to really ensure um, that all our metadata are published without any restrictions and can be reused uh, without any restrictions. Um, and it comes with the uh, list of standardized rights statements we've seen yesterday that every object um, must uh, use in one way or the other <coughs> in the EDM rights field. And as I said before, without that, we won't uh, publish anything in Europe now. Um, these are the two rights statement suite we are using, Creative Commons, uh, probably it's, it's um, the most commonly um, used a suite of licenses. Uh, Rightstatements.org uh, is something that complements this suite uh, for situations that are not covered by Creative Commons. Um, and I think with that suite, we are well covered for now. If you disagree or have other suggestions, also curious to, to hear your take on, on this. <coughs> what is uh, very important for us is also looking back at the use of Creative Commons license because we, we often see that being used to, to um, encourage or certain usage scenarios, but Creative Commons license are actually meant to be used uh, when items are under copyright. So they cannot be applied to items that are in the public domain and really they require an underlying copyright to be present. And um, they also can only be applied um, or with the permission like of the, the rights holder of, of those items. <coughs> and as I said before, uh, if you use Creative Commons licenses, that's great. Uh, we encourage always using the more open licenses from the, from the Creative Commons uh, suite to enable maximum um, reuse. The public domain charter we also heard yesterday about, um, and like um, I think Julio was saying it, it's the sort of manifesto, <coughs> which is which is true. It's not a law, but we really we believe in the public domain. Uh, we really would like to to also foster it and want to um, see that every work that is in the public domain in the analog form comes back in the public domain also in the digital form. Um, the much we like open data and the public domain, uh, me personally, I like accuracy even more, uh, I would say. Um, that's maybe a personal uh, um, thing, thing for me, uh, but if you are want to encourage use and, 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 and um, use open licenses for cop copyright content, um, this would not be um, a, a great thing. So here are a few examples when we can we have suspicions that things are inaccurate. For example, if you are, have a large collection um, that uh, from 20th century works that you um, label with CC0, um, that's sometimes, that's for us quite, uh, quite it is a sign that you may 
have confused the content license with the metadata license. Um, and we have a couple of cases where this actually happened, where people are thinking, oh, content needs to be, metadata is CC0, so I put CC0 EDM rights, even if a different uh, license applies to the actual content. But that's something that is important to keep in mind. EDM rights is only for content. Metadata is kind of automatically labeled as CC0. There's no way to enforce it anywhere in the data. It is like this. When you sign the data exchange agreement or work with an aggregator, metadata is CC0. What is also, um, uh, yeah, raise our attention, like if we see large collections of 20th century works with a public domain mark. This is also quite unlikely um, because most 20th century work is still covered by copyright. Um, so that's not really possible. It's actually also one of the big problems that we still have, this whole 20th century black hole. Um, you see like an increase of data from earlier centuries and then suddenly a drop. Um, and then an, a quick increase again um, towards the very end for everything that's born digital. Um, that's because of that limitation um, of the, the, the public domain. Um, when we see large collections of priest 20th century works uh, with other statements in public domain, CC0 or the um, no copyright, uh, non-commercial, or no, now I forgot what the acronym is. Anyway, um, <coughs> so for us, the, these works are really likely to be in the public domain. Um, I think there's an O missing. No, no copyright, I don't know. Anyway. Uh, <coughs> so if these works should be likely in the public domain and should be also labeled as, as such. Um, of course, there are exceptions, like in, in, in Spain, where things may be a bit different. Um, but in, in most countries, the situation is like this. Uh, and as said before, if, we're, if there are really large collections with a Creative Commons license coming in, we also have sometimes a closer look because <coughs> it also means that there is copyright in there. And it's not always... The, the case um, that institutions can apply those CC licenses easily. Um, sources of in inaccuracy, and <coughs> um, now I'm getting to, this is the same Menti, uh, Menti slide deck I've used before, to look a bit into data quality and um, uh, copyright uh, qu quizzes, so I hope you still have it open, um, but also a hint that on that platform, uh, we are, uh, I'm going to sign off five minutes. I don't think I'm going to make it. <coughs> uh, that we have more training material online uh, already in a, on a new platform that is um, here. And uh, you can also train your copyright um, I'm still in presentation mode. Yes. Um, <coughs> talking about data quality, um, just just to see uh, how much you un un understand already um, of this, to 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 see um, what what your what your understanding is. If you can actually read this, um, this is one of the the images that I have that I also used in my slide deck, um, and I wonder what you think is the content quality of of, of this. This is. Um, um, yeah, if you if you make if you make the math, uh, it it is uh, one thousand four hundred by thousand. It's more than um, one point four megapixel in size, and it comes with a, a CC by SA uh, license. And um, while voices are still coming in, I see a, a quite a diversity. It's interesting, um, but I need to say that everyone who is voting for tier four is, is, is correct because it is of high quality and because it's, it's open, um, it's actually uh, openly licensed, uh, that's what it counts. What it maybe I, I've missed and maybe that may have confused this as we have a direct link to that image, which is always required uh, for images to be published on the Uganda website, you always have to have a direct link. So if it has that quality, it must be tier four. It can never be tier one, two, or three. 
um, because tier three would be if the license would be more closed, restricted. Tier two um, uh, is a much lower quality and tier one would be an image that is even lower in quality and we may not even have a proper direct link. <coughs> so congratulations to the 40, 48 still counting that are um, made, a, made a good good guess. The second example uh, could be a little more tricky um, to, to, to estimate. It's an image uh, with, uh, again, like a, a CC by SA license, but with a different um, technical uh, quality. <coughs> and I'm seeing votes coming in, and it looks like that tier three seems to win. Um, while this is coming in, um, and to also maybe uh, get back some, some time, uh, tier three can only be the case if it's a restrictive license, something like CC by and C and D or so. If it's CC by SA, uh, if it has the right technical quality, it must be tier four. But as it doesn't have the right technical quality, it's actually tier two. This is a um, um, typical example of a tier two uh, item, 800 by 794, I think is still below 0.95 megapixel. <coughs> so this is a um, tier two item. It can't get into anything higher because the technical quality is, uh, is too low. And now I have a even more trickier example. <coughs> um, it's, it's this. Uh, it's again like an image, uh, Creative Commons uh, CC by NC, non-commercial, <coughs> uh, with, uh, yeah, <coughs> calculating 837 by 552 is maybe not everyone's um, uh, favor favorite. Um, it seems tier one is, is winning. Uh, this is, and here is something that actually is uh, also sh showing some, um, making some, um, admitting also problems on our side. This item should be actually also tier two because of the size. Um, the problem is, uh, for some reason, we don't have technical metadata. Um, we have the technical metadata, we ha but we haven't dealt with them properly. So this comes out on our website as being in content tier zero. Um, I'm saying this and I'm telling you this also to say that there are sometimes issues, also technical issues, so if you spot anything where you think like this can't be true or this is weird, no worries. Talk to us or talk to, to, to uh, the Spana colleagues and, and flag it with us so we can see how we can fix it. Um, there are technical, it, it's a very complicated process also technically how, it, how it's run. Um, so we are, we are used to those issues um, and happy to work with you and fixing them if uh, things are incorrect. Um, that was meant to be as a, as a call for this. So this is, would be ideally a tier two object that is still uh, possible to work with. A few questions about copyright to see where you are in your understanding. Um, if you see this object, this is like a piece of, of, of from a rock or so, do you think that this image or the object itself was ever protected by copyright. Um, <coughs> is, is that, it's, a, it's actually about the object, it's not about the image, it's about the object. Um, and I see that a lot of you are believe that the object itself, like that piece of rock, uh, once upon a time was protected by copyright, um, but still a large number is saying no. So it's a bit of an e even uh, call. Actually, the unfair answer is that it was never protected by copyright, so no would be correct. It's a piece of rock um, that there's no copyright in rocks. Um, and there may be copyright in the image. That would be the case. Um, creative choices, lightning, lighting to have a properly look on an image. So the image, well, could be protected by copyright. The actual object, um, not. Next one, this kind of item, nice statue. 
uh, is from a um, creator that died in 1795. Do you think that this work, the actual statue, again the object, is still protected by copyright? <coughs> um, yeah, here it seems to be easier. Maybe you're, you're more used to art than to rocks. Um, <coughs> for me, rocks are closer to my heart than, 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 than art, but yes, you're, you're right. It's probably not protected by copyright. Um, this is a scene from a comic book that was created by an author who died on 15 September 1930, and another author who died on the 15th of March 1940. And now it's very small at the bottom, I think. When did the work enter the public domain? Was it on the 15th of March 2010, or on the 1st of January 2011, or on the 15th of September 20 2001. <coughs> uh, <coughs> um, again, an even call. Uh, maybe worth noting, um, the 1st of January is always a date when items enter the public domain. Um, it's, it's always like, like a fixed date. And then it all, all depends on the, 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 the death of the, the last author. So 1940 plus 70 is 2010, so the 1st January 2011 is a day when this item enters the public or entered the public domain. Um, so we are still working in many legislation with the 70 years uh, after the death of the author, um, and many of you have got this uh, correct, very well done. Um, and I think this is my last question for this. Uh, you digitized a set of public domain paintings and, uh, and consider claiming rights on digitization to control if and how people use them. Can you actually do that? <coughs> um, so this is not about like claiming rights um, to um, because there's right, because you claim rights because you, you want to control usage. Um. And uh, I think we are, we are, we are coming here to, <coughs> to see the Spanish situation um, to be winning the game. Um, uh, there, are, there are only certain cases, like many of you are saying, where this is possible, um, like in Spain, um, but in, in, in most other cases, uh, not. I mean, you... So um, it's not true that uh, copyright is always credited through the digitization. That's not, not the case. Um, and it's also not true that it's always copy fraud. Um, so there are cases where it actually exists. So also uh, most of you got this uh, right. I think I will skip the last. I think there's another one coming, but I will skip that. Um, and we'll keep the rest for uh, the, the remaining 20 questions for Adina. I think as we started this session um, later than planned, uh, I, I hope I still have a couple of minutes. Um, I want to look at, quickly look at um, the two other dimensions, um, uh, two other cases, uh, metadata quality and titles and descriptions. Um, that's something important um, as well. And I'm, I'm picking an example from a 3D item. Um, this um, lady that was submitted from Denmark and um, something also we encourage for all twinned items, that they come with uh, multiple languages. Like here, as you can hopefully see, um, um, is it the title description? Uh, we got both in English from Denmark, as we get it also in Danish. So we have two titles, and if you switch the portal to either display it in English or in Danish, you see either or. So this really also helps, if you, uh, like also for the Twilight um, object from Spain. I hope we also get a Spanish and an English description. So user, users from Spain using the Spanish uh, version of our portal can, can read about this item in, in Spanish. And we achieve this with the language tags uh, in the metadata that uh, Sarah was also demonstrating yesterday. So it's that same feature that really also moves up the metadata quality, and it's particularly useful if you have more than one, one language in there. If it's only Spanish, that al already helps, but if there are more languages, then really our portal can work with that 
and display things according to the language um, that it's um, displayed with. Context. <coughs> Another point also we've seen in Sarah's um, workshop, the, the importance of contextual classes. And actually, um, what, what you've done yesterday kind of challenged me a bit. Um, so I, I, I tried something. Um, so this is the item that you worked with yesterday. Um, and uh, in your workshop, you ended up with, it's now in the very corner only, uh, you managed to get this um, up to metadata tier, tier A uh, by cleaning the metadata fields, adding language tags, <coughs> adding the contextual classes. Um, but I went a step further and actually I got it into metadata tier C <coughs> um, afterwards. And um, this was, um, the way I've, I've done this <coughs> was something I actually, um, and also, now it's getting very small. Um, um, the way I managed to doing this is actually now, um, you, you see the same subject and place and information also dis being displayed in, in Spanish as well, al alongside uh, and English. Um, so you, you have uh, a, the, a multilingual feature um, as part of this is, uh, here as well. Uh, you also see like for Segovia, <coughs> as it's a place that we have already an entity in our website, <coughs> um, you, you ca have the chance now linking through to e other content from Segovia, even from content about Segovia that is not from Spain. Uh, this is a feature that is also enabled by what I've done with the data yesterday. And you also get a map. <coughs> so you, you know, or a user that doesn't know where Segovia is, uh, can, can see it on the map and say, okay, this is <coughs> uh, in that region, in that area in, in Spain. <coughs> so what I've done with to the data is I've actually deleted the contextual classes Sarah developed uh, yesterday and replaced those <coughs> links that were in the data um, um, coming from the original authority file with Wikidata links. <coughs> and uh, I've done this for the creator, I've done this for the subject, I've done this for also the, the, the place. Um, I may have not used the same granularity information, so I may have missed something, um, but it, it may still work better in some cases for, for an audience outside of Spain. <coughs> um, so this is something we also encourage to use, if possible, use Wikidata uh, links um, to uh, enrich your, your data, because that's something, and Alina will also show you afterwards, <coughs> we can work with those links and make more out of them um, that we possibly can do with the other links. Um, and all of this, and all you need to know, um, you will find, if you go to UNR Pro, the share your data, data section um, has all the links to the documents that I used also here in my presentation. <coughs> and a very quick last uh, sentence is, what does all of this mean for us transitioning to the data space? I've mentioned the recommendations from 2021 already, and I've mentioned these very ambitious targets that are in there. And those targets are actually based on the publishing framework uh, criteria. So the commission really said, like, expects um, everything that contributes to fulfill those recommendations to be in content tier two and above, and in content tier A and above, <coughs> um, according to our framework. So. That's something we have to work with. That's something the commission has, has proposed to us. Um, what that means is like for, for Spain, and that's maybe also an interesting thing as a side note, we have a data quality statistics dashboard that you can all have access to um, via that link. I think we will share the presentations with participants afterwards. Uh, so maybe you can also have a look at this. And here you can not only see the quality of your own data you have in your PNR, but also like in this case for the Spain as an entirety. <coughs> so Spain is still doing well uh, looking at all the other countries, um, but the, the, the slightly scary moment comes when looking at the, um, the targets that the commission is expecting from, from Spain. So at the moment, uh, this is what Spain has to have in your PNR by uh, December 2030. It's about five million items in tier two and A plus, which is about double the, the amount that we're having right now. So I think there's a long way to go still. I also 
have, have seen. There's a lot more data in Spain that is available out there that is currently in, in Europeana. So I think uh, I'm optimistic um, also maybe with that conference today and um, w working together in the future on this, we will be able to make this at least for the 2D items. For 3D, um, I'm a little bit more pessimistic, but for 2D, um, I think we should all be optimistic. Uh, we, will, we will get there. Thank you. Ahora continuamos con Adina Chocoyú. Adina es coordinadora de metadatos en el Departamento de Agregación de Europeana y nos introduce en el establecimiento operativo, cómo obtiene Europeana los datos, cómo funciona su enriquecimiento y a qué conduce y cómo se puede mejorar la calidad de nuestros datos. Adelante, Adina. Um, hola a todos. Um, you must have seen me without a uh, headset, and it's because I uh, understand Spanish, but it's uh, difficult to, to speak it. And uh, yeah, that's what I want to say, that <laughs> I relate to those that understand English, that it's, but it's difficult to, for them to speak it, so no worries that you're not the only one. It works the other way around. Um, yeah, so um, I've been doing this work uh, for 10 years now, and sometimes it feels like that uh, lady there <laughs> carrying a lot of load uh, on her head. Uh, it's a beautiful picture, beautiful picture. Um, and I, I can also understand how for some of you that are uh, at the beginning of this journey, it can feel like uh, uh, a heavy um, thing to start with. But uh, yeah. With practice and trust and confidence, uh, you can make it and with help from others. Um, yeah, so, um, well, this actually session is a um, complementation of what was started yesterday by, by my uh, colleagues at Hispana Altara mostly. Um, we um, heard about yesterday uh, um, the Meta Sandbox, the tool that is uh, used for um, you to uh, test the data. But now we uh, will look at how actually it works on, on my side um, for the final publication uh, process. So um, we start with the Meta Sandbox that um, um, Hispana colleagues have access to it and, and also uh, you as an institution, you may have access to it. To, to test your data, and then um, colleagues at Hispana share their uh, data with us uh, via uh, software that is called Jira, uh, where we keep track of uh, everything, uh, all, the, all the data set information and um, um, data set IDs, and then I, I go further and process it in a um, similar tool as Meta Sandbox, and from there it goes to the um, Europeana website. And this is um, the work between um, aggregators, CHIs, and uh, us. So it's, it's a, always a, a joint collaboration. Um, yeah, so um, there's actually little difference between Metis Sandbox and Metis. Metis um, and it's developers, eh? they just do things for the sake of you know testing and then pushing to production because it's just safe to test before and then uh, make sure we push to production uh, of good quality and uh, valid data. So uh, the same the same uh, eight steps are uh, in Metis Sandbox as well for me in in the Metis production, and they are. Um, harvesting, validation, transformation, validation again, uh, internal, normalization, enrichment, media processing, and index of publish. Um, yeah, okay. So what is actually the difference? The difference is that one is a test environment uh, where you can run a, a data set and where you see how um, the records look like. 
um, in a Europana uh, website instance. That, that's not um, a public version, uh, that's not the official version of the website, but it's more for you to have an idea. And you also get to see the, the quality of, of the records that uh, you process there, as you've seen yesterday in, uh, in um, Sarah's uh, uh, workshop. And then uh, on my side, it's mostly the, the final uh, processing and publication aggregation to um, Europana.eu. Um, so we started initially with uh, having METIS that was developed in 2018 by my uh, uh, colleagues at the office. And it's an open source software. And it's a collaboration between uh, the Europana Foundation team and um, um, technical team in the Poznan Supercomputing Center in, uh, in Poland. And uh, as a trivia, it's called, uh, it was named after um, the, tita the Greek titanes of uh, prudence and wisdom and counsel. Why is counsel? Hmm. Yeah. So the data that I process in METIS goes to the um, 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 public official Europana.eu, so it's, there are two different uh, uh, index insta instances. Um, and here maybe you can see or not, but I see, yeah, it's a bit uh, <laughs> unclear. Um, there are uh, two, uh, the, so the other differences, uh, as also Sarah mentioned yesterday, you can fill in uh, information that might be relevant to your records in the sandbox, um, like country or language. But then when, you are work, when I am working in METIS, I need uh, accurate information. So that's why it's always important to get from your side uh, um, specific information about the country, about the um, yeah, data provider, and, and so on. So in, in the, um, on my side, I need to have this uh, clear information. Well, so let's start with uh, briefly going through the steps. Um, so harvest, import, what does it do? It, uh, it just gets, fetches the data from uh, uh, your OAI PMH or from Hispana PMH. Um, so the, uh, the aggregators uh, um, transfer protocol or um, the export can be via a file. Um, we are uploading it on a server and then we process it from there. Um, it's uh, a recent um, addition, a couple of years ago, we uh, implemented um, the incremental harvesting, which means uh, that uh, if providers have their uh, servers set up, so that's a condition uh, to, um, for, for the provider to have this uh, in their, on their site, it, it works uh, on our site to only uh, process updated or new items. And, we strongly encourage that because if we update collections uh, regularly, it's um, yeah um, lower load on our side uh, and on the tools as well to process only updated and new uh, items. And yeah, Hispana thankfully have has this, has this. Um, yes, and then um, validation. Um, so whatever um, EDM we receive from the uh, provider, uh, from the aggregator, uh, we call it uh, uh, EDM external. And then the first step is to um, validate this against uh, a schema. And that, that's what, what happens in this, uh, in this uh, uh, step. Um, and then um, there's transformation that um, yeah, this step uh, uh, transforms and, and cleans the harvest data from uh, EDM external to EDM internal. And you would ask why two flavors of uh, EDM? Uh, it's because, um, yeah, we in, the, uh, in EDM internal, we add uh, additional classes, so to contextualize more the, uh, the object. So we add the uh, European aggregation class, that is uh, based on the um, data set information that is uh, already existing uh, in the data or it's, um, um, from, it comes from uh, um, uh, the sandbox. And uh, the proxy class, we had um, uh, country and uh, language information 
Um, and yeah, during, the, during this step, the European IDs are generated. So I think I have here an example. Yes, I do. Um, yeah, so this is a, an example of uh, um, source ID provided CHO from, uh, from uh, a, Hispana, uh, a Hispanish data set. Then uh, you see how, how it looks after transformation. Uh, that might, it might be that, yeah, there are some things that are uh, different. Uh, I failed to mark them here, so apologies for that. Um, and then the um, European aggregation class is added to the normal um, record. Uh, this is another example where uh, the same for the, yeah, let me make sure if you see, it. Yeah. Uh, for, for a record then uh, after, uh, during transformation you have, we have this uh, uh, or a proxy added to it. Then it goes with, um, yeah, a validation internal. Again, we, we check if everything uh, is, is okay against our uh, internal schema. Uh, there might be issues here coming up, but that's ma mainly uh, coming from uh, like server issues on our side, and it's uh, sometimes it's just uh, talking to uh, my colleagues and they look into it. Normalization, the following step, we heard a lot about uh, this yesterday, but we also do uh, normalization on, on our uh, side where we just uh, uh, clean spaces, whatever spaces there are, uh, HTML markup tags, uh, uh, duplicate statements, so if there is uh, duplicate DC type, duplicate uh, DC, um, this, no, this description, DC, whatever field is duplicated, we, and, and equally, they, they have equal values, then uh, we clean that up and keep only one. We normalize the language uh, again to uh, from uh, yeah to um, uh, the ISO standard, um, and there is a lot of currently there is uh, some work uh, on um, R and D. My colleagues uh, are working on date normalization because the um, the date the DC date that we get or other date formats that we get it's it's not only specific to um, a year. It can be it can vary a lot from different ways of listing the, um, the year, uh, month, um, date, or the other way around. So there's, there's a lot of things there that uh, we, we discovered in, uh, we, we have in our database. So more generally, there's uh, uh, something else coming up. Um, and then, uh, yeah, we fix encoding errors in the, uh, any given uh, media URIs. Uh, so, Wait, let me take a sip of water. Before I move to enrichment, because this is a very, um, let's call it spicy topic. <laughs> um, well, uh, understanding enrichment at uh, Urbana, it's always, uh, yeah, it feels always that uh, for partners it's uh, difficult to, to get, but it's because of, you know, um, things are, um, not always very clear. Um, so here, uh, I, I try to put it as clear as possible, but then we do enrichment twofold. It's from adding conte context um, or by um, the referencing that means resolving uh, vocabularies like Henning showed. So then uh, through textual values, what do, do we mean by that? And I'll have some examples where there's a, a word um, in a field that can be enriched. We just yeah, find that word and look for um, uh, an entity in our um, collection, entity collection. And uh, that's where everything gets uh, plugged in together. And then, um, the, uh, through uh, like the, um, the equivalence relation with the, um, with the uh, contextual uh, entity that's uh, also done by uh, matching the, the values. So um, yeah, here there is a, an example I found yesterday <coughs> of uh, DC type uh, in Spanish, which is Libros, and there is no other uh, language to it. 
Um, during enrichment, uh, we look at, at Libros, uh, but then we fetch uh, an entity that eventually ends up as book. So uh, if you look at the uh, website in, um, in English and look for book, then you, you get that, but you get also uh, if you're looking for, uh, for Libros. So, uh, here there is two, uh, I put two screenshots with uh, looking uh, at books, at the entity book, at, at the entity libro, you, you get to see that there's uh, uh, more or less the same um, content retrieved. For um, contextual uh, classes, then we have, uh, yeah, there's the DC term spatial, Espana and Henning also mentioned it earlier. Uh, this, um, yeah, if there's a literal value, then we create um, a, a class for it, but it's even better when it's uh, uh, Wikidata or, um, yeah, GeoNames uh, uh, URI in it, so, um, yeah, there's much more, more specificity. Yeah, not in, uh, not in case of uh, Spania, but, Spania, but um, specifically on, on the region. Um, yeah, so this is how, um, this is another example from, uh, yeah, uh, Gran Canaria and uh, Las Palmas de Gran Canaria two times. Uh, then we see here how um, this got, gets to uh, be displayed on the portal with the map and also with the, um, with the two entities, uh, Canarias and, and Tenerife and uh, users can follow those uh, entities and then uh, refine their search into uh, more content. For time span, indeed, as I said, uh, we have these different uh, um, dates um, that are uh, used, and in this case, we, uh, there is, uh, we look at the, the dates added in uh, DC terms uh, issued, so the, the date when the object was issued, and uh, DC terms temporal, the, the, the time period where um, it belongs. And here with enrichment, we just categorize that into uh, saying, well, 20th century and different ver version of 20th century and um, yeah. Uh, yeah, what's there? Uh, 19 XX, that's 20th century enrichment. Um, yeah, another example is the uh, organization entity example um, where, and I think Henning can help me later about it. Um, so uh, from here, we, we get um, another collection uh, created, which is the uh, organization uh, page. And um, yeah, that, that needs to contain uh, extremely accurate information all the time, please. Um, yeah, just a refresh to, to mention here the um, LOD vocabularies, the URIs that we are supporting. Um, and yeah, we strongly encourage uh, everyone to uh, use these instead of um, other forms because they are very, very specific and they, uh, they can be very, very specific and uh, point to uh, help uh, retrieve the content easily. And yeah. The other one, which is uh, uh, media processing, another uh, tricky, um, step. So the data can contain uh, media files, media uh, links to media, and uh, yeah, uh, that's uh, EDM is shown at, or is shown by, or uh, object, EDM object. It can be uh, images, videos, audio, um, yeah, uh, all, uh, all formats that we support. What we do here, we, we download the resources to create technical metadata. So it's the thing that Henning mentioned earlier about uh, the technical metadata. Um, we don't keep this download. We only extract technical uh, um, metadata from it. And 
Yes, sometimes it impacts the, the provider server, so uh, at the time of processing. So it can be cases where, um, yeah, if I'm processing a set uh, now um, and the server is very busy, I don't get uh, all the uh, technical metadata and the, the items are in content tier zero, but then it's because I know of this, um, yeah, dependency, I get to like, uh, talk to Maria and tell, Maria tells me, well, run it overnight, okay, then I'm running it at the end of the day and <laughs> that's, that gives a better result. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, from this, during this uh, step, we also create uh, thumbnails for images and from a PDF files. And um, yeah, um, since uh, I think, two or three years, we can adjust the speed of media processing uh, with a, a feature called, called throttling. So it has different um, types, different, different speeds and different, um, yeah, for, the, for retrieving the, the technical metadata. And for the geeks out there, there is a note uh, on the, um, yeah, applications that we use to extract technical metadata. Um, then, um, yeah, preview and publish. In, um, in, in Meta Sandbox, you can get fully to, to publish, whereas in, um, in, in Metis, uh, there's an uh, intermediate step that, you know, I, I get the, the set in preview, I share it with uh, the aggregator, and they get to review it, and me as well, before I, I send it. Um, and yeah, uh, sharing some suggestions and um, so on. And then, uh, yeah, if we fully agree, then we get to publish. But then in, uh, uh, in Metis Sandbox, there's, you can uh, already see that uh, published. So what is important here to, uh, to note is that uh, in preview, uh, we determine and add the uh, content tier and metadata tiers. And yeah, the records are, are saved to uh, a database called, called Mondo, MongoDB. Um, and this database is designed to, to preserve the record and all its uh, components. Whereas with, uh, with publish, the record is saved in uh, a, data save, a, 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 um, a database um, serve that serves the search, and that's called uh, Solar. And this is the final version uh, that is uploaded uh, to the definitive storage where it can be accessed for, uh, uh, by European APIs. Well, a note on the Metis Sandbox, and it's very small up there, um, that we clean it uh, regularly, so don't expect to have a data set in the Metis Sandbox for many, many months. Uh, just, yeah, uh, work it out, look at it, find what you need, and uh, yeah, forget about it. Um, well, I have a bit of a check-in time to um, see if I lost you or not, if you were able to follow. Uh, let me see. Um, yeah, if you can go back to the same entry. Okay, so um, yeah, my question here is uh, <laughs> uh, maybe those that know do not vote. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, at which steps are LOD vocabulary uh, accessed and added in the data? Yeah, well, there's a predominance for 
enrichment, and that's actually true. Well done, well done. Thank you for listening to me. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. Oh, wow. Oh, wow, thank you. Yes, the next one. Um, which step is calculating the metadata and content years? Woo! <laughs> Woo! Huh. <laughs> I, I see this bit got a bit boring. Eh? <laughs> I lost you here. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. Well, to recap. <laughs> um, yeah, well, who of those that voted for media processing can just share why it's media processing. No? Okay, okay, <laughs> good, good. I, I won't force it, I won't force it. Okay, yes, it's because... <laughs> oh no, it's preview, it's preview, yes. Um, yeah, it's at, it's at preview, it's at preview. So we have... Huh? Yes. I, I declare we have three winners. Uh, <laughs> or four, five. Ah, now you cheated. <laughs> yes. So it's, it's always after uh, we process the, the media files. And with the processing of, of the media files, we also look at the, um, all these um, fancy values that Henning uh, shared earlier. Um, enabling uh, languages and, and, and so on. Uh, yeah, and, and last one. Which step brings new or updated records in the Europana.eu portal? Kaboom, yes. Oh. <laughs> Spoiler. <laughs> Okay, great, great. Perfect. Well, I leave it to that because that's a really nice number. Thank you very much for Well, <laughs> I wish. <laughs> I wish. Well, uh, if I can have back the presentation. Yes, okay, so these were the answers. Eh? Enrichment, media processing, and indexing. Uh, I w how much time do I still have? Henning? What I want, okay, great. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> okay, so um, now I'm actually uh, walking you through um, a bit of a practical processing something in, in the Meta sandbox. Um, yeah, I, I was doing it uh, with screenshots and it's, yeah, I hope you will be able to see it. If not, uh, reach out to Maria or to uh, myself. So, but before going into the actual training, uh, actual um, showing you uh, how it works, uh, please remember that we have a training material about the, the METIS sandbox and a user guide on, uh, on um, European knowledge base or even on the uh, METIS sandbox interface. So, uh, don't be afraid of it, the tool. There's always guidance behind it. So here we go. Um, this is how it looks when, when you access it the first time. And yeah, we have here uh, data set information, as I said, where you add information relevant to uh, your collection. 
and in this case, um, yeah, I was uh, I chose to uh, process a, a set that it's already in your in your opana, but for these purposes, I, I also have it here. And yeah, you can choose between uh, um, yeah HTTP and OAI, and I've added there. Oh, too bad. Uh, the um, Hispana parameters, harvesting parameters for this set. This is the, um, yeah, the um, OAI PMH of Hispana, the starting of it uh, for uh, Capuchin Digital Library. Uh, yeah, so this is how it actually looks when I start processing. Um, it's larger than a thousand um, items and you always, uh, Meta Sandbox is limited to uh, only process uh, a thousand uh, items. Um, so whenever there's more, you will get this information, this note, some records were not processed uh, and that's because the, the, the set is larger than uh, what uh, the tool can do. Um, as you process, you get to see some uh, uh, error reports and that might be useful for you to, to know from beforehand uh, because yeah, you can, you can look at the um, uh, specific uh, records and, and see what's wrong with them. Then here um, there's, yeah, it's still, process, uh, it's still processing, so it's uh, still running. And then, uh, yeah, you can have a look at the uh, data set statistics. So you can already see uh, in which uh, tier the, the, the items are. Um, there's also, um, yeah, there is a, a button to track the data set and there's a, a button to see the, uh, the issues, an overview of the issues. This is, um, uh, looking at uh, specific problems that appear in the data. So uh, problems with uh, duplicate, uh, identical titles or, um, yeah, uh, or, or no, uh, near identical and long descriptions and it's just uh, long titles, it's just too, f it, there, there's nothing wrong about it, but it's, it might be a problem if, if you want to, to check it and to look at it. Um, um, yeah, you can have uh, more insights into uh, the issues here. Um, yeah, and the, the, um, the view details, uh, it's, and, and the links are, are always uh, accessible. This is a, a preview uh, from the Metis Sandbox. It, it looks exactly the same as uh, a preview from, from Metis. Um, then we have here the um, um, tier distribution where, where you see exactly, um, yeah, um, the, the items and their quality. So there's always explanation next to it um, why um, a certain item was uh, uh, labeled as a uh, certain tier or lower or higher tier. In this case, we have, um, I think it's, yeah, uh, it's content tier one, and we've probably, let me see before, no, okay. Yeah, so, um, yeah. Uh, why these are items are in content tier one? If I look closer to this, um, I see that there's no, no thumbnail, thumbnail per se. Um, and yeah, looking at the data, I, I saw that there is some, yeah, there is data, there, is, there are resources, but then uh, I see some items being in content tier one. So then, yeah, what happened here? In this case, um, the technical metadata was uh, not being extracted. So the, the item has uh, the links that uh, it needs, but 
for some reason, and it's, it's this case of, you know, server access. It was either uh, a timeout or a, uh, not found or a temporary uh, uh, not found and, and so on. So in this case, we just see the impact of, yeah, uh, getting in, getting a record into a lower tier, which is yeah, the others, uh, the others were in a higher tier. Um, yeah, there are no content tier two or content tier three. That's fine. That's totally uh, understandable. The sandbox shows us like that, and then we see that there are uh, content tier four. Items, but why are these items in content tier four? And Henning already expla explained earlier. So the open license, the media files were uh, directly accessed and technical metadata was properly extracted. So um, yeah, it's, it makes sense that uh, it's a higher tier. When looking at the metadata tiers, we have metadata tier zero. In this case, um, and we we want to see why those are metadata tier zero. And in this case, it's probably because they are missing. Wait, let me see. Yeah. So um, the metadata tier is the minimum value awarded, and there are yeah elements without language qualifier fours. And yeah, distinct represented contextual classes zero. Um, yeah, enabling elements. So already we have, yeah, zero A, A. So the, the one that, uh, that is awarded, that is given to this set is zero. It doesn't matter if it has the other two. Here I have an uh, um, example of metadata tier B uh, item from uh, Castilla, Biblioteca Digital de Castilla y León. And this is because, yeah, okay. Yeah, it has, it has di distinct represented contextual classes B, and then it has um, enabling uh, elements, C, but then, yeah, it misses uh, languages, uh, element, elements with, uh, it misses uh, XML languages. So it's ended up in tier B. So when in doubt, do reach out to us or to your uh, aggregator, Hispana Euskariana Catalonica. Um, there's this reminder about the publishing guide, uh, which Henning uh, referred to uh, earlier, that's also uh, accessible and available uh, on our uh, webpage, when our, on our European knowledge base. And then the final steps is about this, finalizing, so we have an institution, we have the, the processing uh, in the tools, we have the um, aggregator uh, intermediate, and then we have the um, internal uh, organization of uh, data set organization and um, processing, and then we have uh, the publishing. So this is um, a snapshot from, from Jira, the platform that uh, yeah, uh, we, I use with uh, our, our aggregators, and this is the, the, Hispan the, the um, Cappuccinos the, the, yeah, set. We schedule this uh, as uh, it comes. Um, yeah. So this is a snapshot from Metis. It, it looks a bit different, but it's, yeah, it's more or less the same. Um, here I have an example of enrichment, but I think I can go through them because, uh, yeah, Henning already mentioned it. But maybe do you want to already mention something about organization, Henning? Yeah, I think we're here.
Uh, yeah, um, I'm coming in because I, I feel like organizations is, is kind of my new hobby, uh, working with this, and this is like, a, um, can be a bit of a frustrating experience, but it's actually meant to be a very positive experience. So uh, as um, also Isabel has, has shown, we really went, we, we really want to feature organizations um, more on your PNR because that's, it's a, it's at the core. We are not working for the sake of featuring ourselves or, or anything. It's organizations and their data uh, are in the middle of, of what it is. So <clears throat> what we try to, to achieve is to also have organizations having their own representation on our website. And one way of doing it was to make sure we have organizations becoming their own entity. Um, so we have to standardize organization names internally. Um, yeah, so every organization now ha gets from us an identifier. Hispana has its own identifier, and also the, the Cabotinian Library has its identifier, and ideally also we have a Spanish and an English uh, name for every organization. Um, so users from different language backgrounds can understand what this organization is about. For Spanish it may be quite all right for an English speaker to get, get what an organization is, but Greek or Bulgarian may be more difficult for all of us to, to read, so that's why we want to always have English there. Um, and this is a screenshot from our customer relation management system. That's where all the organization information is stored and managed. Um, and what is not in there will not work for us. So every organization name has to be in there. We have a chance to also add alternative names, so multiple alternative names um, if organization names are changing or if you use variations of this, but we have to have that organization. If you change the name of your organization in the data without telling us, informing us, uh, those records will not be visible on the organization page for your organization. This, this is very crucial for us. Um, ideally, and this is what we want to get to, is that you're not giving us the organization name as that string, but you give us the identifier in the data, then we always know this is you, this is coming from your organization. <coughs> and this is already something that's possible, so I'm not sure you, you, you that is possible for, for a spanner, but you could give us the identifiers with the data, and we would be able to, to match it uh, with the correct name that we have stored in our um, customer relationship management uh, system. Uh, and yeah, let's, let's skip, skip this. Um, and then, as said, you will get that a page like this. <coughs> um, and it works always like with these names, with the same names. Um, the beauty of this is we could even have a chance to change your name uh, without processing your, your data. So like if you decide tomorrow you're not called uh, Biblioteca Central Cabochinos de España, but I don't know, um, Archivo Central Cabochinos de España, something like this, <coughs> probably very unlikely. Um, we could only change the name in our CRM system and then update our entity collection with a new name and it will be set. We wouldn't have to process, reprocess all, all the data. Uh, but it really is important that we stick to that, that name and we don't change the name without um, uh, keeping us informed. <coughs> um, where this becomes uh, sometimes a bit problematic is um, so the situation that we have uh, in, in, in Spain uh, that we also have seen yesterday is that a lot of organizations are working with repositories and that we um, sometimes have the names of those repositories being named as the organization. So in that case, we have an organization page for the Biblioteca Virtual de la Provincia de Malaga. Um, and we can also create a usage dashboard for that repository. But behind that virtual library, there are several institutions. Um, and I got a request from the Biblioteca Canovas del Castillo de la Diputación de Malaga, probably terribly pronounced, um, and they asked me for a usage dashboard. And um, I, I couldn't give it to them because we don't have that information in, in your piano because that's not the name of the 
organization or repository. Um, I understand its situation. It's it's also how 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 things work um, in Spain. But it also it's um, important for for you then to understand that there are certain things that are not possible to to get uh, when when we we don't have this. So we can only create an organization entity and an organization page and a usage dashboard if your organization name is in the EDM data provider field. <coughs> and if you if uh, if you're changing that name, also please let us let us know. Uh, maybe a bit of extra effort, uh, but I think it was meant for um, to also help you, featuring you more prominently on your Piana. Um, and it's still a process in development, so we understand that there will be questions uh, about this, and we're happy to hear them, help you through them, and answer where, where possible. Um, I hope this was clear enough, and back to Adina. Yeah, thanks. So, yeah, there's uh, the step of uh, feedback, exchanging feedback, and uh, uh, yeah, um, Sarah and Maria going to check with the provider, so then there's a bit of uh, communication there, and yeah, then it's publication, and that's how it looks here. Uh, I think it's still the cappuccino set. Yeah, cappuccino set. Oh, yeah. And this is, it was mentioned before, so I will skip it. Uh, yeah, that was it. Now, I'm done. Now, now you can uh, clap. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, so uh, questions are. We are mostly happy to get them. Uh, yeah. So, anyone with any questions? Um, um, unless you are totally overwhelmed yeah. now, you can always always contact us later. But uh, we are happy to <coughs> answer questions about anything and everything. Yeah, sure, perfect. Yeah. Okay, is there a microphone maybe? Yeah. If you s okay. So you need uh, well I I need to talk in English and no 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 Sí, mi pregunta es en relación con las marcas de agua. Eh, desde la visión de un bibliotecario que tiene un fondo patrimonial, eh, en el libro antiguo pues, somos todos conscientes de que incluso habiendo, por supuesto, variaciones de estados, etc., pero siendo exactamente la misma publicación, el, el libro como objeto material, el soporte, tiene a veces otros elementos diferentes, tiene escolios, anotaciones marginales, tiene características materiales propias de la encuadernación, etcétera, que son muy específicas, incluso relativa a lo que son las páginas de texto. Entonces, en esa medida, yo creo que a lo mejor el tema de la marca de agua, de que sea o no eh, aconsejable, dependerá de los materiales. Porque para mí, eh, a medida que, si no lleva marca de agua, por ejemplo, una, de, una determinada obra que yo tengo con unas características muy, es, muy específicas, a medida que esas imágenes se vayan reutilizando, se pierde completamente la relación con ese ejemplar, que es un ejemplar específico, con, unas, con unos datos concretos. Y entonces, en esa medida, yo, así a priori, sí que creo que la marca de agua siempre va a identificar ¿Cuál es ese, ese ejemplar? ¿En qué centro está? No sé qué os parece este tema. Quizá dependerá de los materiales, por eso es lo que yo pienso. ¿no? No sé. um, I'm happy to res respond. Yeah. To that. I mean, it, um, I, I've heard a number of arguments pro con watermarks in the past. This was a, yeah. I never heard this. That's a very good one. Um, but maybe. Uh, there are various types of watermarks, um, um, and one I have shown was a very intrusive one that really is um, all over uh, the, the, the place. Um, there are providers that are using uh, less intrusive ones, like more in the corner, uh, something like this, that still potentially a user could cut out for a specific use case or so. Um, 
So that would be maybe a compromise to, to use watermarks that, uh, for that purpose, if there's really that, 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 that reason, that are less intrusive, that give a user the, the chance to also, maybe also not obscure the content that is maybe hidden by the watermark. So that would be my suggestion. If watermarks are really necessary, thinking about solutions that are maybe in, a, in, a, in the corner or uh, somewhere in a place where it doesn't really interfere with the anticipated usage of the items. So I have a very quick technical question about the EDM format. So we've been seeing the contextual classes and as I understood you would prefer if you use the URL of like Wikidata information like that. But in that case, you're not using the contextual class. You're not using like EDM agent. You're using mm -hmm. Dublin core fields. Is that equivalent? So we can just forget about the EDM agent like to get to tier four, for example, or they're not get that right. Well, um, yeah. So if, if you feel like the the, um, the URIs are not enough, you can uh, already create a contextual class for agent to add more 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 descriptions. Mm -hmm. um, but then Europana will automatically create those contextual classes. So, for example, if we had additional information about someone that yeah. it's known in the yes. Okay. So, for an agent that you have information that's not in Wikidata, then you can have the Wikidata link, but then also an EDM agent with other contextual information that you have about it. Okay, and that's always using the SCOS vocabulary. Yeah, right? yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you very much. Welcome. Yeah. Maybe quick. No, maybe there's also a way like to amend Wikidata if there's something missing that can be yeah. added to Wikidata, so more people can then uh, harvest that as well. Um, some vocabularies offer the, the opportunity also interacting with them and um, improving this. Might be also a way to think about. Thinking, I was thinking about information that is way too specific, way yeah. too local. For example, we have a database of doctors and then we have something yeah. that is way too specific. Yeah. Maybe they're not going to add that to Wikidata or, you know, authorities. Yeah. So True, <laughs> yeah. But in this context, it would make sense to add it, uh, yeah. as I understand. Yeah, thanks. That's all, folks, I heard from the room. I'm echoing it here. Thank you for being here for us. <laughs>